Hello, it's Don Michelle from Boho Tarot, and today I wanted to share with you and talk a little bit about how I've been working with Circa de Tarot. So this is a fairly new, new-ish deck by uh, Lisa Robertson, illustrated by Josh Tufts and produced by Llewellyn. Now it does come in the standard Llewellyn big box thing, but as per usual, I have recycled the big box and I just keep my guidebook and my deck in a bag that I made. So I wanna talk a little bit about this deck because this deck has been fascinating <laughs> to say the least. Um, I have actually edged mine in this like orangey color to pick up the orange color in the um in the backs i love the backs of these cards i just have to say like these are kind of some of my favorite backs and i really really debated on the card edging because that's like super important right i was trying to decide between this like maroony purple color and the orange i started with the orange because if down the line i decide i don't like the orange i can go over it with that darker color I know, super important. That's really why you're here, right? Okay, let's talk about this deck a little bit because this deck is kind of fascinating and I want to talk about a couple of um, very specific things with this deck, particularly the court cards because um, that's something that's a little bit different in this deck and I want to talk a little bit about my thoughts on them. So this deck um, does follow your fairly traditional Rider Waite Smith in the depiction. Um, there's a court. So as we're flipping through here, I'm just going to start pulling those out because I do, again, want to address those specifically. Um, this deck, I find, does take a pretty positive approach to the tarot. Um, it does have a kind of an ally and a challenge that we see in the guidebook where we can take a look at those more um, negative or shadow aspects of the cards. But overall, it does take a fairly um, positive approach kind of a little bit of a self-empowerment approach, I would say. Um, it's a really interesting a guidebook in terms of the way that it's written it definitely feels like you are stepping into the big top like in the way that Lisa Robertson has written it so it's kind of a treat to read the guidebook and we'll we'll take a, a peek at it here in a moment um, but as we're just real quick flipping through the cards and I am pulling out the court cards um, I want to talk a little bit about the illustrations because I do think that they are really cool in this deck. They do follow, again, more of the Rider Waite Smith in a general sense, but you can see here with this moon card um, where we don't have any of the traditional imagery. We have the moon, but it's more in this, this big face. The fool and the um, ringmaster, who is here, the ringmaster is the high priestess. The fool and the ringmaster both appear multiple times throughout this deck, which is really interesting. So you can kind of see um, where they align in the journey. But you can see here in this moon card that this is not our traditional moon. And in fact, the moon is like peeking out behind this curtain. And in the guidebook, she does talk about um, the moon in terms of phases and not always needing to be seen, not always needing to be in the um, spotlight of the moon. So again, a little bit, a little bit of an interesting kind of uh, different interpretation. Um, I mean, look at this Eight of Wands. The suit of wands in this deck, the suit of fire is really fantastic. And I feel like that was also the case with the Mermaid Tarot by Lisa Robertson's. Um, she does a wonderful job with the wands, with the, the fire suit. But I really enjoy the interesting kind of different interpretation of the tarot in this deck. My biggest actual quibble with this deck is not the court cards as it is for many people. It is this empress. And if I had to like really pick apart one aspect of this deck, it would be this empress card because it kind of talks about her being pregnant and almost in a lazy kind of sense. And like I get the um because it talks about like eating your cake and there's a little bit I guess of an Alice in Wonderland kind of vibe here as well but she really does dive into the guidebook about just you know letting your creativity kind of run wild um and the fool here is trying to like catch all of her rabbits um I'd have to actually go back and read the whole interpretation but that to me that write-up on this card was a little bit off-putting 
just because that is not at all how I see the Empress energy. And when you compare that to the um, very strong depiction of the Emperor, they don't really align. It's kind of like the Emperor is like kind of this lazy pregnant woman who's just laying around eating cake all day, and the Emperor is this um, big dynamic figure. Uh, she does talk about, you know, the Emperor being like size doesn't matter type of a thing, which kind of made me giggle. Um, but... That's really my, my biggest quibble with this deck is actually the Empress card. Uh, my only other kind of question mark when it comes to this deck is the Hermit because I don't really see how the Hermit ties into the circus theme, um, even in the guidebook. But again, just kind of getting those first few little things I'm not so sure of, like out of the way, right out of the get go, right? Again, Fire Suit is amazing in this deck. And I really enjoy the fun circus theme of this um, of this tarot deck. I love that we see the ringmaster, who's the high priestess, uh, really going in and being active in this deck. I love that we see the fool in many of the cards where we can see where he's participating. Again, look at the fire. Oh my goodness, it's fantastic. I love that we get this kind of clockwork um, energy in the pentacle suit. The cups are, of course, very watery. Again, we will talk about the cords because I know that is an issue for a lot of people with this deck. Um, but look at here with this nine of cups where we have all of these wonderful cups and they are just kind of one flowing down to the next, down to the next, and the next. There's a little bit of a nod to the, to the thought there as well, which I really quite enjoy. And it's a really, really cool, interesting um, depiction of the tarot, I will have to say. I've, it's, a, it's a fun deck that I've really enjoyed reading with. So let's go ahead and talk about those quartz because I know that for a lot of people and what I've heard um, in various videos and talking with other people that the court cards in this deck are the issue for a lot of people. So let's go ahead and divide them up and take a look at those and talk about them more in detail. Okay, so I have heard a lot of people refer to these, we've all heard the term lazy pips, right? I've heard a lot of people refer to the court cards as lazy courts. Um, and I think that there is, on first glance, I could definitely see where people are getting that idea from. But when you dive into the guidebook and when you actually work with these cards, and I think that it's real important to mention that if you read the cards strictly as people and personalities, then there might be a little bit of a disconnect for you with the court card of this particular tarot deck. I, however, do not read the courts as being specific people or specific personalities. They can certainly embody that, but I more see them as being the personification of their suit. So each of the page, knight, queen, and king, for me, in the way that I read tarot, personify certain aspects of the energy of their suit. So it's not about the person, it's about the personification of the energy. And that is a little bit how this particular deck addresses the court system. So it actually kind of works for me. So let's talk a little bit about the courts. So it says, it's time for the performers to get ready for their next part of the show. Each of these cards will reveal the four steps the performers go through to prepare themselves for their moment upon the stage. So again, looking at it through the personification of this, the energy of the suit itself, not specific personalities. So we're going to follow one character through each of these suits as they move through the process of transformation within their particular suit energy. So let's start with the pages. So it says the pages are where it all starts in a quiet dressing room surrounded by the possibilities of who and what you can become. So all of these pages are getting ready for the show, right? This is, this is the first stage of embodiment. This is the first act of stepping into your particular role. So then we move on to our knights and it says, you will notice something very interesting about these knights. They are neither masculine or feminine, but rather they straddle both in a non-binary imagining. They are merely a representation of how someone likes to show up and engage in the world. So we've got that knight energy where the characters kind of put on the, the personification of their suit and now they're getting ready to go out into the world and act in accordance to that personification 
personification. So you can see them here all putting their gloves on, all getting ready to step out into the world in that very nightly taking action, going forward into their particular um, aspect of the suit. So then here we have our queens and it says embodying your inner queen is about suiting up and getting into character. Being a queen has nothing to do with gender and everything to do with how you think, feel, move and create. So you can see this energy represented and for me the queens are about the cultivation of the suit. So you can see each of these queens here kind of they've stepped into their role into the night and they are now uh, manifesting or creating with the element of their suit. So then we have the kings and it says this is the final moment before you get on stage. You have completed your preparation and the spotlight awaits you. You know, it talks about stepping up into leadership. So really the kings are about that mastery of their suit now. And I think one of the things that can cause a little bit of trip up is that these do look quite similar when you put them together on the table. So when we look at them laid out together in their kind of evolution here we see in the page we're kind of stepping into that getting ready to embody the energy of the suit in the night we've now put that embodiment on and we're going to get ready to take out and put it out into the world in the queen of cups and i think this is where it gets a little bit confusing and i do have to say i'm a little bit on board with that kind of i feel like these could have been um, illustrated a little bit differently however the thing that i do like about them because we're looking at the queen here she's cultivating cultivating the energy of her suit and we see the mirrored image of that reflected in the king where we now have mastery of that cultivation and we do kind of get a little bit of a sense of duality here which I do like to see in the queen and king because we can see the two different aspects the um you know, internal and the external, the masculine and the feminine, even though this deck is very specifically talking about non-binary figures in the uh, court system, we can see the dual aspect of these energies. So if we're looking at it kind of this way, where we have the preparation, getting ready to embody the suit, we've We've put the suit energy on here being the suit of water. We've, we're getting ready to go out and put it out into the world to act in accordance with that suit energy. In the queen, we are seeing that cultivation of the suit. In the king, we're seeing the mastery of the suit. And when you put them together, you can see that duality. You can see that balance between the two. So looking here at the sword, here we see getting ready, stepping into the personification of the suit of swords. Here we're wearing it. Here we're cultivating it. And here we've mastered it. Again, you can see the duality in these two cards um, they do in this particular suit I think really do look more of the feminine masculine but that could really tie into the duality of mind um, we could also look at that as logical mind and the emotional mind there's all kinds of different ways that you could look at that type of duality within the suit of the mind so here we have our suit of wands where we have the page getting ready. We've put the suit on now. And here you can see we've got our two aspects, the um, queen and king, the duality of the suit come together in the whole, which I think is actually quite, quite wonderful. And finally, here we have our pentacles. So again, our page, our knight, putting that outfit on, and then our king and queen. Again, these do look more feminine, masculine, um, as we saw in the uh, wands as well. So I think in some of them, they're a little bit more non-binary than others, but I definitely like that kind of duality pair. And you'll see, I keep putting them together because that is how I'm seeing them. The, um, the way that I am personally seeing them, and this is of course all just my own personal interpretation and reflections because I don't have any insight or knowledge into how this deck was created or how it works or what the creators had in mind beyond what I could determine from the guidebook. So this is just all coming out of me um, not only reading the guidebook but working with the deck itself and I do really enjoy seeing these personifications and the progression of the energy of the suit rather than focusing on individual personalities. For me, this aligns much closer to how I actually look at the court system of the tarot, you know, which is kind of the student, the learner, the getting ready to 
take that suit energy and all the lessons that you've learned in the ace through the 10 and putting it out in the world. And here in the night, we are putting it out in the world. We're putting on that energy of the suit. We're putting on all the lessons that we've learned and we're getting ready to take it out. We've got the queen where we've got the feminine aspect of the suit itself. We've got the cultivation of the suit itself. And we can see that represented here through the emblem that she's creating. And then we have the king where we have the mastery of that suit as well as the mask aspect of the suit and so I see these as two halves of the whole and these are kind of like we're stages leading up to the um, balanced duality of cultivating and creating and mastering the particular suit that we are looking at so for me it actually works really really well and I actually really enjoy it because I don't read the courts as people <laughs> So while I may say the Queen of Pentacles is my personal card, and that's my significator, right? She represents me. I don't actually, in most instances, read the court cards as people. I read them as the personification of the energy of the suit, the student, the messenger, the creator, and the master. And that is how I see them. And that very much relates back to the Major Arcana, which is a whole nother video all in and of itself. So really, I could have just done a video talking about the courts in this deck because they are different, right? And they are they are interesting. Um, I think I've got them all at the back now. And I think if you're not viewing the courts from that particular perspective as I am, I could see where this this would be a challenge to work with when these courts would come up because you'd be looking at these going, they're the same, right? It's the same page um, that we see in the pentacles that we see in the cups. It looks like the same page. It looks like the same image that we see in the wands here. So I can see where that, that would cause an issue because they definitely do look the same. But if you look at it from a progression point of view, then you can really see how these particular court cards lead you through the progression of being the student to the master of the particular suit, which is again, in alignment with how I read the courts. Now, if you read the courts as people, that might not work so well for you. So um, I definitely wanted to kind of address that and give mention to that before I talk too much about working with this deck. Um, I, as I said, my biggest issue is actually not with the courts, but with the Empress. But again, I can I can look over that. Um, I don't have to adhere to the interpretations in the guidebook. I'm always going to take that into consideration, but then I'm always going to read a deck based on my own personal understanding of the tarot because I'm reading for me. So that makes the most sense for me. I do love this magician where um, she talks about the hat, you know, being larger than life and kind of like not, not being too big for your own pants kind of an energy, which is really cool. There's some really fun and interesting things going on within these cards this whale with the Ten of Cups. Um, there's a lot of creative aspects to this deck. And I think that this deck would be a wonderful one to um, do creative work as well, particularly if you are like struggling with your creativity, this might give you a chance to kind of tap into that playful kind of energy. And I think it works really well as just kind of giving you a different perspective on the RWS because it is essentially an RWS deck. So if you read the RWS and if you understand the, the kind of basic structure of the RWS. This deck definitely follows that in a, in a basic sense. But if you look closely at the artwork and if you look in, dive into some of the um, write-ups in the guidebook, you'll you'll see that there's more going on here than, than just what's on the surface. Um, there's lots of things going on in the background too of these decks. So there is a mention in the guidebook, um, Lisa Roberts mentions that like the circus itself, sometimes what's going on on the center stage is not really even the most important thing. Sometimes there is more going on in the background of the card than there is on the forefront. So when you're looking at this and we're looking, oh, it's the five of cups and there's five cups spilled and you know, the um, this is actually the Hierophant, which I wanna talk about here in a moment because the Hierophant in this deck is kinda of cool. Technical advisor, I think is, is what she's called in, in the deck. She's got looking at all these cups and of course she's like upset because we've got the three cups spilled here and there's one here. This one's getting ready to knock over. But if you start really diving into the details of this card, there's a lot of really interesting things going on. We have um, this person who's kind of like pointing, like almost, is it accusatory? Did you spill these cups? You have this person over here that could be like, oh no, my cups, right? You've spilt my cups. And we have this person over here who looks a little bit like the court of the cups is back here in the background. But the interesting thing is if you see here, this, this 
table or this chest that it's on, actually like the, the legs are like animated. So it spilled the cups most likely, right? But you wouldn't get that on first sense. And that's, that's I think, interesting. Um, again, there's a lot of really interesting things going on in the background of this deck. And I do appreciate, there's that Empress card. <laughs> I do appreciate when there is more going on within the cards than we just see on first glance. And it can add a lot of depth and interest to a reading. Again, we see that same figure here. Um, this is a little bit reminiscent of the Temperance card, which is quite interesting. Again, you can see here's the Ten of Pentacles and what draws our eye is all of these lovely pentacles coming out of the smoke here. And But look, there's, there's people in the background kind of like lurking in the background. And are they envious of that wealth that we see here in the Ten of Pentacles? Or are they maybe the people that we're going to be supporting with our Ten of Pentacles? It's a, it's interesting when you look at the background. Um, I do want to talk real quick about that Hierophant. I'm not going to dig through the deck and try to find him because, or her, um, because, you know, we have the big, the big picture here. So the interesting thing about the Hierophant is, let me just read a little bit from the guidebook. It says, it takes years of practice training and on-the-job experience to be as capable as our Hierophant. She's confident, calm under pressure, and holds the power of the entire show in her fingertips. Her mind is steady and her faith in herself is strong. It is this sort of demeanor that allows others to shine and have faith in themselves. The Hierophant radiates knowledge and expertise. She stands strong in her power of right and wrong. She has to, as other people's lives depend on getting it right. So it really talks about her, and this is here, it talks about she's a leader, a miracle maker, a crisis management specialist. So it's really interesting when we're looking at the Hierophant through this view, really stepping outside of that traditional popey energy that we tend to see in most RWS decks. And here we're looking at kind of the person behind the scenes, the person that supports the rest of the actors within the, the show, within the major arcana. So this is kind of the, the supporting character, the kind of foundational character that knows what's going going on, knows where everybody needs to be, and has the presence of self and presence of mind to be able to manage all of that in a way that means that the show will go on, right? So this is just a really interesting interpretation of the Hierophant. Um, there's a couple of different things in this guidebook and in this deck that Lisa Robertson has done and Joff Josh Tufts has illustrated that uh, really does something different and interesting and kind of goes its own way, which I quite appreciate. I quite appreciate a deck that um, isn't afraid to stray a little bit from tradition and can depict uh, the many, many different aspects and interpretations that we can find within a tarot deck. So I think it's pretty cool. I think it's really interesting. Let's go ahead and talk real quick about cardstock and all that good stuff. Um, again, it did come in the big typical Llewellyn box, uh, which I, of course, no longer have. It comes with a full color guidebook, um, which is lovely, but sometimes I find the binding doesn't hold up real well. If you if you use the heck out of these books, just be, be a little careful is all I'm saying. We have a page for each of the, the cards here. Um, not quite as much for the minors as we do the majors, but every card has an ally and a challenger. Um, the only thing that I feel that this is kind of missing is maybe some keywords. If you wanted to just like do a quick flip through to kind of get some keywords as a jumping off point for your reading for working with a particular card, we don't really have that. You kind of have to mine through the text in order to get those kind of keywords. Um, but I think the write-ups are pretty cool. It's designed to read kind of like you're attending a circus, which is neat because it's a kind of, you know, thematic deck. So kind of fun in that sense. So in the back here, we have um, the Encore, which is the spreads. And we have a couple of interesting spreads. Um, they are at least tailored to this deck, which is really cool. I do definitely like to see that. We have a Seeking the Spotlight spread, which is quite interesting. A Stage Fright spread a seven day show spread, kind of like looking at your week ahead. And then we have a being part of a troop spread. So I think this would be a really good deck and these spreads would be really good if you are working on some sort of collaboration or you're working on maybe trying to tap into your inner show person and you're gonna, you know, trying to, to gain that insight and that confidence to kind of step out and share your message or share your gift or share your creative work. Um, 
I think this would be a really, really good deck for that as well, as well as a good deck for um, looking at, at teamwork and partnerships and, and building those uh, interpersonal uh, connections because when we when we think about a circus right is very dependent on all of these people coming together to make one big show right to make to bring one big idea into being and it's all of these people and all these really intricate interlocking parts that all depend upon each other and so I think this would be a really good deck given that theme and given the kind of illustrations that we see in the deck to do use this for work where you're looking at maybe Maybe trying to work on collaborative projects or maybe even in work related readings or even relationship style readings where you're trying to um, come together with other people to create something larger than yourself. Um, again, I also think it'd be a good one for creative work. I think it would be a good one for kind of uh, helping you to step into the spotlight yourself. All of those themes, I think, align really well with this kind of circus idea that we have here in this particular tarot deck. Okay, so that's kind of the guidebook. Um, I'm going to move that out of the way because we're, we're kind of done with it. I am going to show you, give it a shuffle. Um, this is typical new Llewellyn cardstock. It's um, a little on the shiny side. I mean, I can kind of put it in the, catch it in the window. Um, it's more what I would call like a satiny finish. Um, if you have the Forest of Enchantment, it's the same type of cardstock as that, which I love because it shuffles beautifully. I know this, not everybody is a fan of Llewellyn cardstock. I personally am a fan of their much older, more kind of mushier cardstock for lack of a better for lack of a better term but I love this cardstock it's thin it's flexible it shuffles well um, it's a great size and I have absolutely no complaints with Llewellyn cardstock I'll be perfectly honest um, so since I clumped all of those court cards up together let's give it a shuffle again beautiful shuffle I really enjoy working with it in that way so there you have it, just kind of a chat about um, how I found working with the Cirque du Tarot. Um, some of the things that I've come across have been, you know, that have been kind of issues for me. Really just a couple of semi-problematic cards, definitely not deal breakers and by any stretch of the imagination. More importantly, I wanted to talk about how I worked with the quartz because I think that is an important part of this deck and definitely something that you need to be aware of if you're looking at possibly purchasing this deck and working with it is that those court cards um, to me, for me personally, em, um, embody the personification of their suit, not individual people or not individual personalities. So I think that's real important to point out. I love it because it really works well for me, but I know that's not going to be everybody's cup of tea. Again, this Empress not my favorite, but there's really like not many cards in this deck that I would say are not my favorite and I don't mind the depiction of the Empress I'm just not real wild about the the write-up and the the particular aspect of the Empress that it's tapping into but I can choose to read it in any way that I see fit and however it works with my particular practice so yeah this deck has kind of surprised me I'll be I'll be honest I bought it because I was curious and because I was like look at that color palette like that's so pretty. Let's let's be honest. This was a total. It's pretty. I wanna I wanna see it up close and personal, um, and that's why I purchased it. And I've been working with it this month, and I've actually really enjoyed it. Um, it's been a little bit of a surprise. Um, this to me is just an everyday reader type of a deck, and it's definitely just on its own a deck that I would pull out for just you know, what do I need to know today? Or what kind of energy might I need? Or if I was looking at maybe working on some partnership work, or I was working on a collaboration project, or I was, you know, maybe even um, a little bit, you know, looking to tap into some creativity to kind of kickstart my own creative uh, work, although I do have other decks for that. Um, Outside of that, that this for me is just an everyday type of a reader deck. It's a solid reader. I don't struggle with any of it. It's very Rider Waite Smith based, so there's always that. It kind of has a very solid foundation, um, but it has a really interesting perspective on the cards, particularly in the artwork. I do enjoy the write ups in the guidebook, and I think that that's also um, adds a wonderful layer to working with this particular deck. But being that it's an RWS, I think you can just pull it right out of the box and read it as well. 
So there you go. That is a look at how I have been working with the uh, Cirque du Tarot. I'd love to know if you have this deck and what you think about it. Um, so please feel free to share with me in the comments. And as always, my friends, thank you so much for joining me today. And I look forward to sharing with you again soon.